Hi, this is just a, this is an informal conversation around sea diversity and resilience with folks on climate adaptation and maybe talking about land races. I'm Rebecca Newburn from the Richmond Grove Sea Lending Library and Carol Henderson is going to be helping out with notes. She's from the uh, Community Seed Exchange in Sebastopol, California. So we're both West Coast United States. So, Kay, you've been doing some land race stuff. So we've had this conversation before. So maybe I'll just start with you. And once again, so we've had this conversation around climate change and everything. Do you want to give us some, maybe some highlights from like today? Because you were talking with Joseph about the land races and what some of the things that you've been doing. So it, every time I listen to Joseph, I pick up some additional things that make me feel more comfortable about going forward with land races. Like he was highlighting how, because there's so much genetic diversity, once you've, you're creating a land race, you don't have to worry about minimum population oh, sizes. Fun. Anyway, I've been working with land races since I think 2016. That was my first foray into it when I was personally having trouble getting butternut squash to grow in my yard, which doesn't have ideal conditions for it. And then I got a hold of some of Joseph's land race moshadas, and I found that everything of his seeds, and I produced a huge quantity of squash in a very small area. And it was so much fun because it was diverse in its size and shape and color. It all tasted great. So that's how I started getting into it. Now we have a, we're fortunate enough to have some space for a seed garden to help support our local seed libraries. And we're taking advantage of some of the existing mixes out there. Experimental Farm Network has some really wonderful land races. So if you want to get a jump start on some of them, you can plant their stuff. In addition, this year, I'm going through our seed library and an example, pole beans, dry pole beans. I am fine. I'm just taking some of every variety we've got and I'm going to interplant them. And I know it's a small percent crossing, maybe 5%, but 5% is just fine in my book. And since we have a seed garden, we'll be able to just keep replanting and replanting to the benefit of our community. And then we'll put things back into our seed library. And I hope I'm not going on too long here, but in our seed library, we're now identifying a separate space for land races. And the challenge is to go about educating the community more on what they are, what to do with them and how to contribute. Great. And I think it's just like this whole conversation, like we're in this bottleneck of genetics. We've lost the whole statistics of you look at the seed catalogs from a hundred years ago to now, and we've lost 90% of that. And who knows how much of what was saved on the individual farms and individual families is we're in this bottleneck and thinking about what are solutions to helping humanity move through this really difficult time. And one of the things that I heard in Nate Kleiman's conversation was when that was the the session that just ended on a climate adaptation with G he and Gina was, and you were there, Jul mm -hmm. Julia, so you can help out with that, with just the importance of bringing in wild relatives and thinking how can we maybe start moving away from some of the annual crops and starting to integrate more perennial crops or at least some of those perennial wild relatives. And I think we've got to be concerned about arid conditions and see if we can move some of our crops more to a dry farming model. Yeah, that, thank you. That reminds me, and I should put it in front of me. So this is a great book. We're talking about resources. Is mm -hmm. This is a book from Gary Paul Nabhan of growing food in a hotter, drier land. So it's something that we all need to be thinking about, but we also have the converse thing, which is Gina is talking about her field now doesn't dry up until mid-May. Thinking about the extremes and how do we, I mean, just some resources I think that are worth pointing out. So this is a book, this is by Daniela Soleri's husband, oopsie, of, oopsie, I should get off of the. It's, it's such a great background though. <laughs> I know it's my school seed lending library. So this is a Daniela Solari's husband. So it's balancing on a planet, the future of food and agriculture. And then another one just from Daniel Solari, who is the Zoom host, food gardening for a changing world. So those are some kind of good resources to be thinking about and that we could be using. 
what are some other things that people like resources or things? And you can just, I think you can just unmute yourself. And if people double talk, we'll just, we'll figure it out. So anybody have any other ideas? Patrick, go for it. You look like you want to say something. So nice to see you. It's been so long. Okay, so it, it was on my computer, not on the Zoom screen. One resource that I've been using, I think for the past four years, is out of OSU and Corvallis, there's there's a dry farming collaborative. There's a nonprofit that came out of that, but there are, but the Dry Farming Institute, and they've done a lot of variety trials. There's a, the, there's a researcher there, Lucas, who's doing a lot of the selection for the dry farm masa corn up here, but they have, I, I got a lot of their delicata, their delicata squash trials, but it's potatoes, tomatoes, beans, corn. Was there anything else? Any other yeah, one? Adaptive, adaptive Seeds has like a whole collection. Yeah, and Adaptive yeah. Seeds is selling some of those lines now. So I, I, I think one thing is that is when we have these dry land adapted selections, we need to get them out there and advertise them at, as such so that people can continue to select off of them. Yeah, and I was just at the Organic Seed Alliance. So if you're not, even if you're not a farmer, it's sometimes good to be connected with the Organic Seed Alliance. They did the California Seed Alliance, the Organic Seed Alliance California Seed Growers Conference which is definitely more related to seed professional growers, but super interesting for even like a seed library. And they were talking about the dry farming and they had dry farming trials. And you could learn about different people that were and get access to some of that seed that's being grown locally too. So that was just another thing to think about is how do you can get some locally adapted dry farmed stuff. Yeah. I've, I've had a seed project going on at my house and it's not vegetables. But if it was vegetables, you wouldn't be able to present it the way I do. I've been growing cotton and flax for linen for clothes. But I had grown green and brown and didn't realize the first year that they crossed. They were maybe 60 feet apart. And anyway, I, after a couple of years, I decided to see if I could uncross it, which meant I'd have to have some friends and family grow some out. Each of us took a different subset of seeds. And I was thinking get back to the original green and brown because if for F1 variety, if it cross, and it's just a perfect example of taking two varieties that are different and crossing them, no matter which bed it was in, it was light brown and had fuzzy seeds. The brown I started with was darker brown had naked seeds and no fuzz on them and the green had fuzzy seeds. After, so each of us took a different subset and we were getting some crosses, but the first cross, for one of them, after that F1 gener F2 generation, there were nine different varieties of whether it's the color or the seed or whatever, nine different variations, which was very interesting. So you could take any hybrid and then save the seeds and grow it out. It's a good example. But eventually, but after maybe it was the second year we did it, my daughter-in-law was, and none of my growers were spinners, hand spinners or anything. And my daughter-in-law had some that had on one plant had four balls of white. We didn't do anything with white and, and it had green fuzzy seeds. So I said, grow that out we, because we almost lost the green because the green was elusive. And so also the naked seeds and naked seeds were only on the original ground. And so she grew out, I said, grow, that's the one you grew out next year. See if we can get the green back. We never got the green back from that. But some of the white, so we got white and brown, not very much white, mostly brown. Some of the white, naked seeds, some had a little bit of fuzz, some had a lot of fuzz. So we kept growing out the naked seeded white. And now we feel like we have we have that size. And which has been a really interesting project. And I made a whole display of it. So you could follow the generations of each of these different things. And so I talked to Sally Fox through email about it. And she said that if it does not have enough genes to express as green, expresses as white. So that's where the white came from. And the naked seeds were from that original brown. So total surprise. But I'd like to show that as an example of what you can do with anything when you're working with seeds. It's just easy to display with cotton because it's not going to go bad. Great. And Cindy, that I'm assuming that is one of your your sweaters that you knit from your own cotton. Is that correct? Yes, I love okay. it. Okay. She's got, see, why don't you put Why don't you put in a link into how to get your book? Because you're coming out with a book soon on. It'll. 
Okay, it, it, homegrown flax and cotton. You can do this. Make your own clothes. There's a chapter on the cotton project. Yeah. So just put that in. Just put that in the chat so we have that as a resource. Awesome. Thank you. So I think it might be good to hear like where are people getting like seed. So this, where are people get sourcing seeds. So I put down like experimental farm network. I think Patrick, you said adaptive, and what were some of the other places? And people can put stuff in the chat too. So we're collecting all that. Oh, going to seed. Yeah. Do you want to, do you want to, Julia, do you want to dry farm? Okay. Dry farming Institute. Great. Thank you. And Julia, do you want to talk a little bit about your going to seed project? Cause this is something that people here would be interested in knowing more about. Yeah. So we, Joseph and I developed a course over the last year and a half on land race gardening. And at this point, the course is a collaborative effort because a lot of people have joined in and added to it. And that kind of grew and a lot of people got excited and we decided to form a nonprofit. Right now we have a fiscal sponsor, so we're not a technically a nonprofit. And we have made our website finished now for now. So you guys should check it out. I think it's very cool. There are a lot of resources there, courses and seeds and joining our online community, which has several hundred people from all over the world. And <clears throat> Over this year, we'd like to do more with local communities. So that's a project that we want to work on. And the one that in your website is the going to seed. It's under. That's yeah. right. It's in the chat, going to seed.org. And I have to say, this is probably one of the most robust chats. So you might want to make sure you know what your settings are, because it is a really, it is a very active group. But these are your people. These are your people. These are some serious seed geeks trying to figure out like, how do I get the wild relative of falsify? Like, where can I get wild, where can I get seeds of the wild pea and mix it in? Cause I'm trying to do this. If you're looking for your people, these are people doing, I think some of the most profound research and work on the planet. So these are. Yeah. You know, and one thing we're really excited about is the seed platform and that's on there. You can find it on the tabs for on one of the can you, can you say more about that just so people understand what that offering is? So what we did this starting last fall, we picked 20 or so crops. I think it was 12 species that we wanted to focus on. And Joseph has had this, Joseph Loftas has had this dream for a while of people from all over the place sending in their seeds and for maximum genetic diversity, mixing them and then making them available to people. So we did that by, we had volunteer seed stewards, which were the people that were responsible for the mix. They were responsible for a species. So there was a corn steward and Lowell is here and there was a squash steward. And I think Debbie is here too. And so they collected seeds from several, I don't know, I want to say several dozen people within the network that had joined the online course, taken the course over the year and were growing in this way. And they made the seed mixes without trying to have one person's seed overwhelm the mix. So there was a good diversity. And then they put them in seed envelopes, sent them to a central location. And then Anna, who I, Anna Myritz, I'm not sure is here, built the online seed store. And we decided they should be available to anyone who could use them. So they're free if you pay for shipping, although we appreciate donations too, because it hasn't been free to do it. It's our pilot year, so it's going to grow and people are really into it. So next year we'll have more species, more specialized mixes for people so that people growing in Northern Canada aren't expecting seeds or aren't getting seeds that won't do well for them from someone in Florida. And there's a question in the chat about how do you, how do the classes work? Are they self-paced or participatory? So they're both, there are, I don't know, 52 lessons, quite a few lessons by now that are self-paced and it's a mix of video and of text. And then throughout, we're still doing this, but it's evolving a little bit. Every month we would have a community Zoom call with Joseph Lofthouse. So could people could bring their questions, get their questions answered, talk about their progress and also join in the online community. And that community has really um, grown and we've had to move platforms because it got so big. It's both, but you can go to going to see.org. There's a courses section and then sign up for free and then take those courses and then join anywhere else that people do. So if you sign up for the classes, you will then get how, if you sign up for a class, will you then get the email saying we're having the monthly chat with Joseph? 
Yeah, exactly. So in one of the lessons, the Zoom links are there and all the seed information is there. So once you sign up for a course, you'll be notified when there are new things, join the community, you'll be in our network. And like I said, these are some serious plant geeks. And there was a question, Patrick was asking, what's the Mexican? Oh, yeah, well, that's a project I've been working on a lot and has been my focus over the last few months. So we wanted to bring in other perspectives from people that have been growing land races because they live in a place where that's normal. And so I focused on Oaxaca and Guerrero, and we have a couple of teachers. It's not released yet, and it's for now, it can't be part of the free offering that we have. But it is really exciting because in, in those areas, they farm in this way where it's pretty intact in the way that they've been, their ancestors have been farming for 10,000 years. So that is coming out in a couple months and we're really excited. Patrick, is your, is social from that area? I don't know if you can hear me. He's typing. Okay. I think his wife is from that area. Okay. And there's another class on how microbes help plants adapt, adapt to local conditions. And that's taught by Dr. James White. And it's shorter, but it's it, there's some things in there that I think seed savers will be surprised at. He talks about specifics and we tried, it's more theoretical, but we tried to have some practical information for, for seed people. So there's some good science in there. That's a big name. I did his class on Kind Harvest. It's really, he's really great. Yeah, so there's different information in here because I took that class too and I didn't want to cover things he'd covered elsewhere and I knew he knew more about the specifics for exactly how plants use microbes to adapt. So there's some new things you will enjoy. Good. And his name is Dr. James White. I'm curious, I know we're very seed focused here, but I'm wondering if other people, I mean, I, the, I, what I was hearing from some of the other people is there's the gardening practices. How do we minimize soil erosion doing less tilling? So that's I think one aspect. And then there's also water as a consideration. That's another factor. So I'm just kind of wondering how we break this conversation to maybe address some of those concerns. What are, what are resources are people doing? What are people thinking about in terms of that? I and mean, I know in California, the drought is a major issue. And then this year it was just like, okay, we just got six inches of rain in the last 24 hours. So any thoughts on that one? And once again, anybody in the room, you're welcome to unmute yourself. This is like a, you are welcome to be part of the conversation. So we haven't, heard, so if you are a person who has been in the back and you want to say something, feel free to bring up another topic. Judy, did you want to say something? Yeah. Hi, I'm Judy from Michigan. And we met in Richmond when I was visiting my son, Philip, Rebecca. Oh, so yeah, you're, the one, you're the one who got me involved in this today. <laughs> neighbor, literally. So thank you. Thank you. So I'll see you next month. Yeah. So in Michigan, I have started the past few years. I'm a huge gardener, not a huge seed saver, but now I'm, you guys have all inspired me. Thank you. We, I do the no dig method of gardening. So it's just, you pile compost on there, you layer it, you plant into the compost, you do tons of mulching. The next year you pile more compost and leaves and mulch, and you don't have to dig because digging disturbs all the soil microbes. So that is how I am personally doing conserving soil and don't have to worry too much about erosion. So it's a big movement in England through Charles Dowding. So if you ever want to follow his stuff, he's got some great blogs and videos on the no dig method. Great. Anybody else want to share any thoughts or? I like the deep compost mulch, but I find the first year it's tricky before the compost kind of mixes with the soil. And then I get like, I have to do a lot of adding nitrogen throughout the season, mainly through like fish or top dressing with dry nitrogen, but it's tricky at the beginning because it can actually like dry out if you don't have overhead, if you're using drip and you don't have any rolled mulch or like straw. It's it's better in the long term, but it's, it's tricky at the beginning and expensive if you're purchasing the Yeah, you're right. For small scale gardening, I'm an urban back, my whole backyard is garden, but so I do all my own composting and then the municipality also has compost available, but you're right. It can get tricky depending on your source of compost, but that's where the mulching helps because the mulching keeps the moisture in, 
and it helps with the regulating everything temperature wise and protection from the sun. So yeah, it can get tricky, but don't give up. Compost, compost <laughs> is the best thing out there. I grow my own compost and I follow the John Jevons Grow Biointensive. I'm actually one of his certified teachers, but I grow cover crop, although the just he was big on growing the cover crops and putting everything in the compost. And then you put it back on your soil. And then in Virginia here in, in North Carolina and Pennsylvania, they started having an early night in early 2000s, they started having the no-till field days about growing a cover crop. And rather than tilling it in early spring, you just let it grow till almost maturity, till it's shedding pollen and cut it down. And they were using big roller crimpers. And I realized, because I was already growing all those cover crops for the compost pile, I realized I could translate that information into how home gardeners can use it and handle cover crops with hand tools. So I did, I produced a video about that, but then I, it's in my book, Grow a Sustainable Diet. But what you do is you just let that rye grow until it's shedding pollen. And my last day, there's last spring frost date is towards the end of April. It used to be, it's probably mid-April now. And that is a few weeks before it's the rye is shedding pollen. So if you, so it's going to be after the frost date. And that the time when rye is shedding pollen is about the time that the farmers are cutting, making their first cutting of hay. And so if you cut your, your cover crop down with a sickle, then you can let it lie down and you'd wait two weeks for it to dry. And that's your mulch and you transplant into it and you've got your cover crop right there and you haven't had to haul things around. So I see there are some other questions that came in. Someone said something. Is there anyone growing naked seed pumpkin on a large scale for food? I don't have an answer to that. And I was wondering to come back to the idea of like how we're going to go about this process because we need to get it right in terms of like we've got a short amount of time to figure out how to make our food system more sustainable. Then I'm wondering what type of record keeping people are doing in terms of their seed production. Uh, I think it's interesting to, like I said, being new to this, I'm signing up for some of the, there's the Seed Savers Exchange is doing a plant breeding project and some other organizations are doing plant breeding projects. I'm wondering if it makes sense for people that are newer to this to sign up to someone who's already doing something. Like I think Bill McDormand's going to restart the plant trialing for grains, but just if people have some ideas about record keeping and how they're making decisions and what they're looking for. Anyone got any ideas on record keeping or tracking what they're doing? That is something that we've been talking about that people really want. And it's a project that we're planning to tackle this year. And from what I understand, I am not the tech person, is that it would be an app on your phone and then you would take photos as you're doing things. And from those photos, you would have more of a record and that could be shared and sort of data collaborated. And I don't know if that's something that people are interested in. Would that be valuable? I, I think it would be helpful. I'm just trying to figure out right now, I've got the kale growing that I got from, I think, Experimental Farm. And I'm just like, okay, I got it growing. I've got like lots of diversity in here. And I'm just assuming it would all go to seed. I mean, some stuff got eaten. <laughs> And so I knocked itself out of the gene pool, but not sure where to go from here. And I got the Grex, I got the, what is it? The bok choy Grex, but it didn't have a lot of diversity in it. I was a little bit, it, and it did not look very bok choy to me. So I was just like, what do I do with that? And it was a good green, but it didn't have, it didn't look like any bok choy I've ever eaten. Okay, well, I'll pass this on that it's important and we need to get working on it to the person who was going to take it on. Rebecca, maybe that's the point. It wasn't supposed to be the same as the bok choy you already eat. <laughs> they said it was a mix of, on the packet, it said you're going to see everything from like traditional bok choy to the tiny Shanghai types to this type to that type. And mine was very serrated leaves. And the taste was much more like on the mustardy side than oh, I think about bok choy not being so intense flavored. And these were all the leaves were really big. The leaves were all this big serrated and really sharp. So would you want to see other people's bok choy 
is I looked at the pictures and I'm like, mine doesn't, I didn't have anything like that. So I'm just wondering when we, oh, thank you. And pa- Patrick put in the seedlinked.com. Yeah. But yeah, so I'm just, obviously I want to save it, but I feel like I need to add on. I think that's the whole thing is that sometimes when we're doing this, it's like we need to add on about what we saw, but we don't even know what's going to happen in the next generation. So it's an interesting journey, especially when we're sharing our seeds publicly, like we do in the seed library. It's what does labeling look like? Part of it getting the message out that this is genetically diverse. We are doing this for a reason. We are trying to get more resilient seeds and also be prepared for surprises. So the in our seed library with the land race, what I'll do is weigh each squash that we're saving seeds from. So I know what size are we getting typically and what's the smallest and what's the largest. And so I try to put those descriptions on the label of the seeds as they go into the seed cabinet, just to give people an idea of what to, oh, and also the shapes. I'll usually put maybe a picture of some of the different shapes that we get because the Moshada land race will have some really blocky squash. And then the Italian type, that's like a tromboncino ball on the end and the big long skinny neck and then the more classic shaped and even some that are a little bit on the round side just again so people have an idea but then the challenge is Rebecca if you happen to get just those seeds out of the packet that were predominantly that serrated leaf lard that's your experience of that land race but when I had I planted a population of 20 so it wasn't oh yeah. And they were all that, they were all that shape. So I was just like, I would expect with 20 that I would have gotten something yep. different. Indeed. So I didn't really put something more dominant or did I just get the probability of that happening? Yeah. <laughs> or it was a dominant gene that just took over everything else around it. And we did, that's what we just found out. Yeah. yeah. And you know how it is with the, the different generations in a land race, different things might express more dominantly in a particular generation. And then what's the generation where you get, I forget if it's three, I think third generation, you get the the most variety expressing. In my cotton project, I believe if we would have just kept growing stuff, we would have ended up with the dominant brown and fuzzy seeds, which is not what we wanted. And we were selecting what we wanted. But uh, anyway, now I'm working on a, we also have another color coming on that's very dark. It's combination of green and brown that we've selected out from one plant last year, not two years ago. We're working on that, but it's just fascinating working with seeds. So my cotton project, I was able to put little small amounts of cotton and the fiber and the seeds, what they look like on these poster boards. And, but yeah, I'm old school, so not quite as adept at just Oh, take a picture with your phone. I didn't have a phone, a cell phone until March 2020, just before the shutdown. But yeah, now you can take pictures of all those squash in the in your garden and have the record right there and then post those on some board or something. Yeah. I think another question that for me is interesting is we talk about the dry farming, which I think we definitely need to be thinking about. But what happens when we have stuff that's all of a sudden really wet? I don't know if I just... Because we're braiding. I mean, it's it's just, I think that I think our answer is just maximum diversity, like just keep maximizing diversity. And I'm just wondering like what some of you are doing, which is like, okay, we've got this big population and you keep adding in stuff to keep bringing in more genetics or what are some of the things that you guys are, that folks are trying to do in order to keep, yes, keep, yes, keep adding. Just keep adding. Yeah. I suppose that'll be interesting to see like after a really wet winter. And then what you can do also is as a hedge, potentially, when you're out there shopping through the different seed catalogs, <clears throat> if you find one that says this one tolerates drought, drought or a really dry growing in condition, grab it. Then if you get something else that says doesn't mind if it has soggy roots, throw that in and then you, you've got a hedge going against whatever different weather conditions you might get. And then we've got smoke and all that. A lot of that is just land management too. It's not necessarily genetics. So it's having drainage and also just getting air in your soil, which for most people, it just means 
having adequate calcium levels so that the clay opens up. Certain farms like up in like Sebastopol in Northern California where it's not drying out until mid-May now because it's there's so much water. There's Last so year with hell up here, it was like wet until June in Oregon. It was an awful year. So the past two years, we've had those extremes of frost and wet when we didn't want them. And then it got super hot, like hotter than it ever really had for the past two years in the summer. So it's did you want to say something? I'll go for it. Yeah, I just wanted to say at the Community Seed Exchange, something that we're thinking about, again, just to hedge our bets, is to look at plants that have maybe a shorter growing cycle. So it avoids some of the extremes. So if it's if it crops that can get ready in a quicker amount of time, it might, at one end of the growing cycle or the other, it might miss some of the extreme weather. So that's just another consideration to think about in terms of trying to hedge your bets. And I think just like what you end up doing is up potting more if it's too wet to put your plants out, assuming you're transplanting, but that doesn't help with direct seeded crop. Okay. I just want to take a moment because we've been talking a lot and I want to just once again, make sure that people know that are sitting in and have been quiet, like you are welcome to unmute yourself. So Maggie, thank you for joining us. Hi. Hi. I participate in our library farm locally. I grow things at my home, but we have farm plots at our library. So we share seeds there, but some of the things that we share information about what we learn, like last year, I think it was that I learned for our tomatoes was they want to have additional magnesium, potassium, and calcium in the soil. And so it's, and we keep it organic. So the way we get potassium is use banana peels and you take your banana peels and cut them up and throw them around your, the calcium, we do the eggshells, even the water, if you're boiling eggs, use the water from boiling eggs because the calcium goes out into the water. <clears throat> and magnesium is from, you can get from Epsom salts to put that around your plants. Thank you. But you guys might already all know that. For that kind of stuff, I usually use Soul Pole Mag, or sometimes they'll call it K Mag. And that works very well too. You can put that resource in the chat if you know the name of it. So where so maybe we could just do resources and maybe just spend the last bit of time talking about some concerns. Mm -hmm. so Anandi said, I'm concerned about preserving heritage seed and crops, especially in an area that does that don't have seed farms to grow them out so they can adapt to climate change and become more resilient. Hi, Elizabeth. So we just had a comment from Anandi that said, is that Anandi just showing up? Yes, hi, hi. Do you wanna share your concern? You can unmute yourself. Okay, yeah, hi, I'm Anandi. And my concern is about preserving heritage seeds and crops, especially in areas that don't have seed farms and where nobody's growing them out so that they can adapt to climate change and become more resilient. I'm in Louisiana right now and that's the concern for me with the crops that we've been losing. Do you have community there that I'm just trying to someone just put something in there. I'm just wondering like how there is are there specific crops you're interested in or I'm just wondering if there's like agricultural projects around that you could work with or partner with that could support that. There are some organizations and I think an individual who's been doing that with some indigenous crops in the area. But even the growers and the farmers that I'm aware of, they they struggle to get enough seeds even for their for their farms. And, that was and, a concern in my region. I live in Virginia, and Southern Exposure Seed Exchange is here. Mm -hmm. They're local to me. And back in, I'm thinking early 2000s. I can't remember which date. They had a Save Our Seed initiative, which. People from the Carolinas and Georgia even came up for that. And they had over the year, I think it was a two-year thing. They periodically through the year, they had a series of meetings for two years about that. And I can remember going to that first meeting and they wanted to encourage seed growers because they were getting all their seeds from far away. Seed growers to in our region to grow in the Southeast region of the US to grow seeds to, for the seed companies. And I looked around at people I knew that were there and I said, oh, I really can't see that happening, but it has happened. And there has so many growers, even my daughter is one of the growers now in the region. And, and she was like just out of high school then. So anyway, people are coming out and it's developing, but it takes a while, but it, it can develop if you, but the most important thing is to save your own seed and encourage other people. To
Yeah. I mean, it, I think also to, just one thing to think about, it's a another step down the road, but also if there are things that are really culturally important to you, do you have a backup plan? For example, I know with in Puerto Rico, when they had some of the hurricanes, you know, there was a large Puerto Rican community in New York and they were able to send seeds back to them. But it's, if you have things that are specifically culturally important to you, do you have relatives that might live in a different area that can dedicate a small part of their fridge? So if you lost something that was really special and unique, that you could get it back. It's a good so, idea. Something that, yeah. My, my mom who lives in Maryland is like my backup plan. So I've got some things that are really important that she, that I periodically regularly give her new seed so that it's, it's still adapting here. But every now and then I will a few years, I'll give her some more seeds, but I would just really try to see how you can make partnerships, whether it's other gardeners or community projects. There's lots of people that are probably similarly minded and it's just a matter of connecting the dots and doing it in community. So good luck with that. Any other ideas? This discussion reminds me of computer backups if you don't have three copies. Yeah. Okay. Any other comments, thoughts? So I think in the beginning, some people were talking about where they were getting their seeds. And there's one thing like Anandi was just saying about something that's maybe specific to her area that she wants to preserve in terms of the more genetically diverse things that people are planting. Um, do people want to just put some of the places maybe in the chat of where they've been getting seeds that are more in this land race or Grex kind of category so that we know where people might get resources to start with genetically diverse crops. You can type them, you can say them out loud. Is, and if you have a website, I don't know, is Nature and Nurture a something that would be available to everybody? Experimental Farm Network for sure. Buffalo Seed Company is really great. They have a lot. Also, of and also if there are some more like regional to let people know, like adaptive seed is more, I would say Northwest US. And is Buffalo Seed, I don't know where they're located. Do they have a particular like, climate that's because we want to find things that are more. Yes, they're in the Midwest, but I got their squash or their melon land race, and I live in a completely different climate. And I planted that was an early melon. I think it was originally from Joseph Lofthaus, and the melons matured three weeks earlier than the heirloom melons, any of the heirloom melons. So I think in a lot of cases, if they're selected for being early and genetically diverse, then they will do well regardless of where they go in most cases. I think that early piece is a one that people need to be thinking about more. I just think about, for example, I'm a member of the California Rare Fruit Growers, Fruit Growers, CRG.org. And we, do, oops, yeah, I forgot the G, you'll figure it out. But basically like I have on my apple tree, I'm talking more about perennials. I have probably 15 different scions on it. So I've got 15 different varieties on one tree. And so sometimes something might if there was a frost or something, it might knock out the early stuff, but not the late stuff. Or if there's a heavy rain, I might lose some blossoms, but not other ones. And I think another thing that came up and I heard it, I think it was Nate Kleiman. So these might be some of the conversations if you didn't get to hear them earlier. And once again, you'll get copies of all this, the land race gardening conversation with Joseph Lofthaus, that would be a good one to listen to in terms of like later when we get the videos, Kleiman and Gina Covina's conversation around seeds to adapt for climate change would be another session to listen to. Nate was also mentioning about you can get seeds from the germplasm repository, but you have to really craft a letter saying that you're doing it for breeding purposes. So there's just not open to the general population. But if you, for example, as I'm a middle school science teacher, and I have said, we're doing some plant breeding projects, this is what we're doing. And then we're going to make them available to the community. We were able to get a number of interesting popcorn varieties, and we were doing a popcorn breeding project a few years ago. There might be things in that collection that might be unique or interesting that you might want to work with or and read into something that you're currently working with. Any other things? I found it help when if you go to their tastings, then you get to meet some of the workers at Grin. But I've gotten a fair amount of stuff from them. But, and but it, it comes to California. The, okay, because I have to say, I think that there's a number of different, like each, my understanding, and I, someone else can step in, but I feel like there's several different germplasm repositories and they all have their specialty. Like this one is focuses on these seed crops and these this area focuses on these seed crops. So obviously the one in California would be work for me, but yeah, good. Awesome. Any last kind of parting thoughts or comments that people would like to share before we take off? 
And once again, we will make this recording available to you. And, and thank you for people putting all of your little notes in there. And Carol will basically summarize everything and wordsmith it to her superpower of organizing thoughts. I have, the- I have one comment. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you, Rebecca, for everything you have done to make this day possible for all of us. My pleasure. My pleasure. Glad it's 301. It was lovely. It was lovely. And I've got a whole week of getting it all organized <laughs> on the other end. But Julia is going to help me with the video. So yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> okay. Awesome. And thank you for everybody showing up. And so many people have been part of this community and really making together. It's definitely a community effort. And we just need to have all the voices. So even if you were quiet on the back end, we are so happy that you were here and uh, look forward to any kind of contributions you want to continue to make in your community, or if you have other resources later that you want to just add, you can just send them to seedlibrariesemail.com if something comes up later that you want to share with us. Okie doke. I'm going to hit the pause button at this point. Okie dokie.